Yo, JKM, I just made this awesome new deco, but there's a slight issue with the materials. Yeah, that's fine. We can get everything. Uh, well, I mean, like, by slight issue, I mean, like, we need a hundred million deep slate. Yeah, that's doable. That's fine. Wait, what? No, no, I was, I was exaggerating. Yo, hello everyone. So, in the last two videos, we've obtained command blocks in survival, and I feel like we need to chill down a bit, which is why in this video, we're going to be working on a project that will mine over half a billion blocks including 170 million deep slate. This is Wavetech, a technical server which I've been a member of since October of 2020. We focus on large-scale builds, which I will eventually show on my channel, but today we are focusing on quarries. But JKM, what is a quarry? Great question! So basically, a quarry is a flying machine that can fully automatically mine blocks while also storing the items. And that is the important bit. You probably heard about or seen a 3D duper or a world eater. They are not quarries because they don't store the blocks that they mine. Don't be fooled by Mr. Raceworks or others that release videos about 3D dupers and call them quarries. That's like calling a flashlight and chandelier, it's just incorrect. There are many quarry designs, the concept has been around for over 70 years at this point, but today I will focus on objectively the best quarry design out there. The second generation Vertical Duper Quarry by Desu Desu and Javi. How does the quarry even work? So it all starts here at the bottom. These flying machines fly towards to push these grabbers that start flying up. They first try to push the blocks in front and then pull back the blocks that couldn't be pushed, separating them from the terrain. Those are the blocks that are gonna be mined. Wait, stop, why does it have to push blocks forward? Uh, it's because that's how the quarry deals with liquids. If it didn't do this, uh, water and lava would mix in front of the machine, basically breaking it. Then, when the grabbers arrive at the top, the water carton gets dropped and while the water is dripping down, let's ask two very important questions. First of all, why are you still not subscribed? And second of all, how is the quarry going to deliver all of those blocks to the blast chamber? Now, this is the fun part and the reason why this is a superior quarry design. It delivers the TNT to the blocks and not the other way around. So right here we can see the water is almost at the bottom. And here we go. The TNT dupers start duping TNT, it gets shot forward and blows up the blocks. The items fall down here and get transported to the left side of the quarry, and from there it's pretty much up to the player as to what they will do with them in terms of storing and sorting them. Oh dude, let's come back to the dupers, cause they are just so sick. First of all, they don't use any minecarts, which makes building the quarry considerably better, because you don't have to clown around with a billion minecarts. Second of all, they dupe the TNT every second block they go up, so the quarry is running basically as fast as the concept allows it to. And all of that while being insanely lag-friendly. It's truly a marvel of Minecraft engineering. So, with all that in mind, let me talk a bit about the quarry we made on Wavetech. Basically, when 118 was in development, I used to watch Mangos and Isuma's snapshot videos, and one thing in particular caught my eye. The Mesa Mountains looked absolutely insane compared to 117 ones, and I wondered, how do Mesa biomes look now? I went on Chunk Base Biome Finder, entered Wavetech Seed, and boom! 3,000 long Mesa biomes everywhere, absolutely insane. But when I took this exact screenshot, I instantly realized two things. 118 will be the quarry update, and this will be the location that will host the world's biggest quarry project ever. Later, we call this quarry Mexico, and to give you a sense of scale, let me give you some numbers. So the area that will be mined by the quarry is 1,056 blocks wide, and the quarry will run for 4,200 blocks. It will mine over half a billion blocks, including 170 million deep slate, 15 million raw copper, and 150,000 diamonds. It is by far the biggest quarry project ever. However, making a quarry is not as simple as just building the quarry from a schematic and running it. Making a quarry requires a bunch of preparation. So, what do you actually need to make and run a quarry? So after you decide where you want to make a quarry, which in itself requires some work, but I'll talk more about it later, 
You first want to make the main trench because, well, you need to build the quarry somewhere. Then you need to make a tunnel board that will clear at least six blocks of space at the bottom of your mined area. And this is by far the most work intensive thing in the process of making a quarry. Then you need to make three block wide side trenches. And fortunately, there are machines that allow you to make them fully automatically. So the side trenches aren't really that bad. And while they are running, you can start removing all unmovable blocks in the area. And and while running the tunnel bore is the most work intensive part, removing the unmovable blocks is the most annoying part. You basically need to remove all chests, spawners, obsidian, crying obsidian, and if you are in 119, also skulk sensors, shriekers and catalysts, and holy shit, those blocks are everywhere. It is basically impossible to remove all unmovable blocks without external tools or using your sanity, more about it later. Next, you can finally build the quarry, but you still can't launch it, because you still need to build the item streams and your storage. And after all of that is done, you can finally launch your quarry and enjoy the items. And trust me, standing in a quarry water stream is one of the most satisfying things in technical Minecraft. All right, so currently I'm in survival and as you can see a lot of stuff has been already done uh, That's because I started making this video like very late into the project uh, Mostly because I'm a lazy fuck and maybe just maybe I got distracted by falling block for a couple months, but yeah um, <laughs> So as you can see we've already made the main trench for the quarry to you know be built in uh, This is actually the schematic for the quarry. Yeah, it's it's kind of big. <laughs> so as I said earlier, the project is very big. It's 1000 blocks wide and it's, the quarry is gonna run for 4.2k blocks, which is, you know, literally the biggest quarry ever. So yeah, as you can see, we have the main trench, uh, but we also have the bottom trench. Uh, so yeah, we've been busy this summer and uh, yeah, we've managed to make this uh, this entire tunnel this 1000 by 4.2 thousand block tunnel in, I would like to say, three weeks. Eagler was definitely the hero of this uh, part of the project. Uh, big shout out to him. He's literally the tunnel bore man. Okay, you know what? It's literally gonna take ages for me to fly through. I'm just gonna go into spectator and show you the end. Okay, here we go, <laughs> finally. Uh, so here we can see the first, actually, this is the third of the three tunnel bores. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't really feasible to run a single tunnel board that was 1056 blocks wide. Um, I decided to divide it into just three tunnel boards. Reason number one is that uh, when you stand somewhere in the middle of the tunnel board, you can actually see both ends of the tunnel. So like you can instantly spot if there is like a water flowing out or, or if maybe some gravel landed right in front of the tunnel board and you have to clear it out. Gravel is the number one tunnel bore killer, by the way. Uh, it is it is very common for gravel to, you know, just fall from the ceiling right in front of the tunnel bore. Then the TNT gets interrupted by the fallen gravel, and so the TNT explodes way too close to the tunnel bore, blowing up some components, like, for example, this piston uh, or this slime block. Those are, like, the two things that get blown up first. So when the tunnel bore then moves forward one block, it, uh, it, it blows itself up. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, here we can see the second tunnel bore, and uh, right here we can see the remains of the first tunnel bore. Uh, so yeah, um, we may have forgotten that this was already here when we were running the uh, second tunnel bore. So like the second tunnel bore literally ran into the first tunnel bore, blowing it up. Uh, but you know, we didn't really care because it's already at the end of the uh, quarry area. So yeah, this took a lot of effort, uh, but it's definitely gonna be worth it, because like, bruh, half a billion blocks, you're never gonna mine as manually in this amount of time that it took us to prepare the project. Uh, also, like, as you can see here, uh, we also have the three white trenches uh, already done. So unlike with the tunnel bore where you have to manually check for all the random things underground to make sure that the tunnel bore isn't gonna blow itself up, this is a three white trencher that can run pretty much fully automatically all the way to the end of the tunnel. This grabber goes down to the bottom of the tunnel, it gets moved forward one block, then it flies up grabbing all the blocks, and yeah, it brings all those blocks up here, uh, they get blown up, and the entire trencher moves forward once again. Uh, so like this process is fully automatic, the only things that can realistically break it is um, I guess obsidian forming or cobblestone forming, so uh, it's very rare for this thing to, to break. 
So another thing that we had to do that you've already probably noticed when I was flying uh, here for the first time uh, was that we have this giant wall of concrete here that is just here to generate kind of the first initial wall of blocks. So for example here, if I didn't have this concrete wall, uh, all of this sand would instantly erode away and uh, we would be left with, you know, a lot of water flowing into the quarry trench. Yeah, I just placed, well, I didn't place anything. I used uh, falling block conveyors uh, to deliver all the concrete powder to this wall. And then I used the flying machine with a water source uh, to convert it all into solid concrete. Uh, so we have some initial protection from wall erosion. All right, so uh, it's been actually a couple weeks uh, since the last clip, but yeah, the quarry has been built, the sorter has been built, the nether site has been built. Basically, we're gonna launch the quarry in a couple minutes. So yeah, I just want to show you quickly how everything looks. So the quarry, yeah, as I said, it's completely done. Uh, so yeah, here you can see actually the storage. Uh, so because the quarry is so wide uh, and long, uh, we have to send the items through the nether to, to the central storage. So here it is. Here uh, we have a bunch of uh, cobble and deep slate sorters. And all the other items end up here at the stack separation sorter. So if I go here... Yeah, you can see here we have all the sort sorters for all the items that are going to be mined by the quarry. So here we have storage for like 160, 170 million items. Uh, and those items are like the non-cobble and non-deep slate items. Uh, because we actually have a separate dedicated storage for deep slate. Just because, well, storing well over 300 million items in a single place just wouldn't really be viable because your client would lag. So if I fly north for a bit, we have a connection in the nether. We're gonna see, yeah, there we go. We can see the deep slate storage. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the quarry is gonna mine 170 million deep slate. Uh, so when Kiku said that we're gonna need a separate storage for deep slate, I just told him, yo, what if you make a single slice for, you know, all the deep slate? Just, just make a one giant slice. And he actually took it seriously, which I... Uh, yeah, I, I kind of love this thing. <laughs> uh, so, because the storage is so big, uh, when it's gonna be full of deep slate, uh, like loading it all at once would be too big of a lag spike. So, Kiku decided to actually load it in pieces. So, uh, first we're gonna send a minecart through this chunk to like load the first part of the storage, then the second minecart uh, loading the second part, and yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> so, here is where we're gonna store all the deep slate. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is future JKM speaking. So, past JKM was an absolute idiot and I forgot to record the entire nether side explanation, uh, which is also a crucial part of the project. So, let's jump in. So, long story short, we severely misunderstood what Kiku meant by transporting the items in the nether. And a lot of members, including me, thought that Kiku meant that he's gonna make the actual sorter and storage in the nether. Uh, so we decided that, yo, since this is such an important project, uh, we should probably make a perimeter for this storage, right? It's going to be the grand storage that will hold, like, several hundreds of millions of blocks, right? Uh, so we went to work, we started clearing the top of the nether, we already made the world eater, and only then Kiko made us realize that, no, by transporting the items in the nether, he only meant that, he only meant the single line. Uh, so now we are left with a 528 by 720 perimeter, um, just for this straight ice line. Great. So, you know, we kind of wasted, like, several days of our lives, but now at least we have uh, another nether perimeter, which means we also got a bit of ancient debris out of this project. So basically, as I said before, the quarry is too long and wide to transport the items in the overworld, we have to use the nether. Uh, so right here, if I start this... I probably shouldn't because it's not loading the other side. Hold on a second. Okay, here we have a bot. So now if I start the clock, uh, we can see that uh, we have a bunch of slime block uh, item pushers. So basically, what will happen is that the items are going to come out of this portal. Uh, they're gonna align themselves uh, up against the honey block. They are gonna be pushed by the slime block pushers. And they are gonna slide all the way to the front of the quarry, or I guess the west side of the quarry area. So, here at the end of the line, we can also see that we have a cart eater. 
Uh, so basically what the card does is that it picks up the items that uh, make their way to the end of the line. So we do this to reset the lifetime of the items. Uh, so yeah, it still takes a lot of time for the items first to make their way to the left side of the quarry and then to make their way, you know, all the way here in the nether. Uh, so we just reset their lifetime and also uh, this was useful for resetting the portal cooldown of the items that came out of the uh, closest portal. Um, so yeah, that's how the items make their way back to the overworld to be sorted and, you know, put into boxes. So up here we also have all the chunk loaders necessary to, well, load the storage. Uh, and also this is where we send uh, full shulkers of Deep Slate. Uh, so they are sent here, stored in this small storage that can hold up to a million Deep Slate. And after the threshold is uh, reached, uh, all the shulkers of Deep Slate are sent uh, through this instant dropper line to the big boy Deep Slate storage, which I already showed in the previous clip. Uh, so right here you can also see we have the three portals, uh, oh, what, what? Well, apparently the storage is broken, I may need to contact Kiku about it, but uh, let's ignore this issue for now. So yeah, this is pretty much what happens with the Deep Slate, uh, it just gets sent uh, all the way to the uh, remote storage. I also feel like I should mention how we even get to this location, so as you can see by my coordinates, we are about, you know, around 5.8k blocks away from uh, zero, 00, uh, and to get that far, uh, we need to, well, we also have the piston bolt, uh, but we mainly use the player cannon. Uh, so what we just do is, well, you need to eat a golden apple, of course, to not die, uh, but you throw an ender pearl, you jump into the cobwebs, and basically what happens is that you get teleported up there, the TNT explodes, and you get sent at like Mach 10 to, oh, I should probably actually pay attention. And you get sent to wherever you want to. And this cannon makes getting to and from the quarry area very convenient because, well, you can just yeet yourself within like 10 seconds uh, to, to the project and vice versa. Alright, let's go back to the main part of the video. Last quick check, so... Storage is running, nether side is running, the only thing that is not running is the quarry itself, right? Yeah. So I guess it's time to actually launch the quarry. <laughs> oh man. Okay, so... It's been a long time since the project started. I want to thank everyone who helped uh, do this project, especially uh, Kiku for designing the entire storage part, both overworld, nether and all the logic re related to the storing the and sorting all the items correctly. <laughs> Everyone who was running the tunnel bores, especially Igler, the absolute legend who did like 80-90% of everything here. Everyone who helped build the quarry itself in survival, especially Trolley, Rufro, Green Jab, Kiku as well. And the quarry designers themselves, Desu and Javi, that is a beautiful machine. So, there is nothing more left to do, I guess. It's quarantine. <laughs> Finally. I've been waiting for this moment for literally a year. Like, I recently checked my screenshots and it's been a year since I first found Mexico on like, well, by Mexico I mean, my, I mean this area. Since I found this area uh, when 118 was in development. You have no idea how excited I am right now. Ah, <laughs> oh, beautiful. <laughs> So yeah, the first slice is mostly just gonna mine, well, why did I say mostly? It's literally just gonna mine all the concrete. You can see the water wall lowering down, and when it reaches down here, uh, we're gonna start seeing some TNT in action. So if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I last tested this particular uh, setup of the quarry. It takes nine and a half minutes to quarry out an entire slice, and if I <laughs> did my calculations correctly, it's gonna take, oh, here is the TNT. Uh, it's actually gonna take around a month uh, to cover this entire area. Oh man, <laughs> first blocks. <laughs> I mean, the blocks that are getting mined right now are artificially placed, so I guess next slice is actually gonna be organic and natural blocks that are being mined. Oh yeah, uh, forgot to mention, for the first slice uh, we're not storing the materials. Uh, Kiku is just sending them to a cactus storage, wherever it actually is. Oh yeah, there we go. So we are actually almost done with this first slice and as you can see the quarry is very lag friendly like we have so many people online uh, with all the packets being sent to them and we are still 
at 30 MSPT, which is absolutely insane. And well, the server kind of has to be playable, because uh, the quarry is gonna take literally a month to finish, which means if the quarry was uh, reaching like 50 MSPT on its own, the server would be kind of unplayable. Like if you wanted to do decoration or do anything else on the server, this would be very unplayable. Uh, but because the quarry is so lag friendly, we can actually do extra progress during all this time that is gonna take the, the quarry to finish. So yeah, just another reason to love this quarry design. Man, this video is literally gonna be an advertisement for this quarry. There we go. First deep slate. <laughs> uh, we're finally getting deep slate. What, what is happening? What is not good? There is a gravel on top of the slam, a, a slam block. What? Where? Uh, teleport to us. Um... How the fuck is it possible, though? It, it, it wasn't floating. Uh, okay, well. I think this looks fine from what I'm looking at. But, like, why would the gravel fall from here? It doesn't make... Yeah, it doesn't really make any sense. So I'm still not really sure what happened, but this problem never reoccurred, so let's just ignore it. Uh, uh, what witchcraft is this? This is Mr. Kiku, and storage tech is his passion. So we have we'll the see. diamond and ore. Holy shit, Igler actually mined 5,000 yeah. deep slate diamonds. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, he... Well, okay. during tunnel boarding, what else was he supposed to do? He was that... Okay, so he... So you're telling me Igler actually made, like, all this insane progress with the tunnel bore, while also collecting all the deep slate diamonds. Well, he would, like, not collect. He probably didn't collect all of them, let's be honest. My guy, that is 5,000 di deep slate diamonds! Well, like, considering how much there probably was, he probably skipped a few, collected... Yeah, but, uh, but, but, but I mean, still... Yeah, no, I know. Man, Igler yeah, deserves, like, an actual statue at Mexico. It's just in there. Oh, yeah, 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 teleport to me, Inspectator. We already have uh, a couple of boxes of deep slate. Holy shit! Oh my god! That is like 50,000 deep slate. Oh god. That is already uh, 50,000 deep slate and the quarry has been running for like 20 minutes. Isn't that more than we have right now? That yeah. is like 10 times more than we have right now. Uh, that, yeah, well, I mean... than we had half an hour ago. Oh my god. Mm. <laughs> yeah, like literally every time I launch a big project like this, for example, and I leave it running for the night, I literally can't sleep. Like, I remember when yeah. we launched uh, the first quarry on Wave. Um, I woke up in the night, like, at 4 a.m. and 5 a.m. two times. Uh, like, because I had a nightmare that the quarry broke and beyond repair. I'm not kidding. Alright, so the last couple of clips were filmed, like, several months ago. And since then, the quarry made a lot of progress. So as you can see, it mined, like, 90-something percent of the terrain that it was supposed to mine. And... It's almost finished. <laughs> and as you can probably imagine, the items are also looking really nice. We have so much copper, gold, uh, and diamonds, of course. Uh, what you're looking at right now is over 100,000 diamonds. Uh, so we already brought a bunch of diamonds and used them for, you know, random stuff. Uh, so for example, Jekyll crafted an entire shulker box of jukeboxes, uh, and later Trolley also used an entire shulker box of diamond blocks, uh, for a parrot farm decoration. So even though we used several thousands of diamonds just for, you know, random crap, we still have a lot of them left. Of course, we also have several million terracotta, but nobody cares about that. What I'm most glad to see is the deep slate, and oh man, oh no. There we go, deep slate. Deep slate. <laughs> deep slate. <laughs> Wherever I look, there is deep slate. <laughs> oh, finally. It's so nice. Uh, we basically have enough deep slate for several lifetimes of multiple servers. Like, who is ever going to use 170 million deep slate? Like, it's it's just not gonna happen. <laughs> okay, that's great. Everything is fine. We have a quarry. It mines several hundreds of millions of blocks. But what about you? Would you also like to make a quarry? Well, let's jump into the tutorial. All right, it's time for the ultimate tutorial. Oh, hold on. I can't just say this word like that. Hello, Kubik. Uh, can I use the word ultimate in my video? Well, it's not like everybody else has been using it. Of course, mate. <laughs> Thanks. Alright, it's time for the ultimate tutorial on how to make a quarry in survival. 
So let's first discuss where you're even gonna make your quarry. Uh, so generally there are pretty much no restrictions as to where you can make a quarry. Uh, realistically you can make it in any biome you would like to. Uh, but traditionally people have been making their quarries in Mesa slash Badlands biome, however you want to call it. Um, so just for the sakes of the tutorial I'm gonna be focusing on Mesa quarries. Uh, but as I said, you can make it in any other biome you want to. I think Mesa biomes are still probably the best biome to make quarry in, uh, just because of the terracotta. Even though it's already renewable in 119, thanks to the dripstone and mud block mechanic, it still takes a lot of time to get a lot of terracotta, uh, which, well, you can get from this area regardless. So step zero is going to be find the biome where you're gonna make your quarry in. So what I usually do is I grab a seed, of your world, right? And when you grab your seed, you go on Chunk Base Biome Finder or any other map that shows you the biomes of your world. So you enter the seed and uh, you definitely want to highlight the biomes that you're interested in, which in my case is going to be the Badlands biome. So I'm just going to select all the Badlands variations and here we go. So now I have a map of pretty much all the Badlands biomes uh, Pretty much highlighted for me. So what you're going to look for are long biomes uh, because your quarry runs in a single direction pretty much forever. Um, that means you want to look for the longest biomes possible to maximize the amount of items you're gonna get from a quarry. So for example this one, this one is a really decent mesa. Uh, it's pretty wide and the quarry is able to run for how much is it? One, two, around 3000 blocks. I would already consider this to be a really, really good mesa biome. Uh, but in case you want to go for a smaller quarry, let's say 250 by, I don't know, 2000, uh, then you don't have to look for crazy biomes like this. Uh, oh, this is actually Mexico, nice. So for the sake of the tutorial, I'm going to stick with this particular biome, uh, and the quarry will run from west to east. So after you found your perfect biome for your quarry, uh, you want to come here in creative and make an area selection of the terrain that you're going to mine with the quarry. Uh, that is for two reasons. Uh, first of all, it's going to give you a material list of all the blocks that the quarry is going to mine. And also, it's going to allow you to see if this is actually a good location. Uh, and you're going to be able to see if there are any, like, annoying high mountains in the area. Well, the problem with maximum Y level for the quarry is that the higher you want to go with your quarry, the slower it's going to take the quarry to mine a single slice, right? So it's going to slow down your quarry quite considerably. So for example here we have some extraordinarily high mountain peaks that uh, pretty much end at uh, the old build limit. Uh, so you definitely don't want to make your maximum Y level, you know, 255 just because of those couple peaks. Um, you definitely want to limit it to, you know, a reasonable Y level and then just get rid of the couple areas that uh, spike above the maximum Y level. Uh, so you can see that this is pretty much the only instance of, you know, a giant mountain spiking up to 255. Uh, the rest is pretty reasonable. But yeah, coming back to the material list. So the quarry I decided to go for in this tutorial is going to be 250 blocks wide and it's going to run for 2300 blocks. So this is the approximate material list that we're gonna get. So 5.4 million terracotta, 22 million deep slate, that's, that's pretty decent. 20,000 diamonds, that's also pretty good. So after you are satisfied with your materials and the maximum Y level of your quarry, you're going to go to step number one, which is making the main trench. Alright, so the main trench has to be at least 21 blocks wide and it has to be at least as long as your quarry is wide. So in my case the trench has to be at least 21 by 250. Uh, however, I recommend leaving a bit of space on each side of the trench, uh, just in case. So how would you actually make this uh, trench? Uh, there are different ways, you can either mine it, please don't. Uh, you can also just randomly drop TNT from above, or you can also use a smooth wall trencher, which is my recommended way of doing it. Uh, so a smooth wall trencher basically just has a couple TNT dupers that drop the TNT down all the way. So the difference between a normal trencher and a smooth wall trencher is that uh, a smooth wall trencher will move a layer down every single time it reaches uh, the docking station. So when this trencher is done, you're going to be left with smooth walls on uh, both sides because, well, the TNT is only falling down and it's not getting, you know, disturbed left or right. 
so you're going to be left with a relatively nice looking trench in the end. So while the smooth wall trencher is running, I gotta mention that unfortunately uh, you actively have to pay attention to the trencher and you have to remove all the liquids because, well, it's not going to be able to deal with the liquids and basically the longer you wait to deal with the liquids, uh, the worse it's gonna get. So you gotta pay attention and clear the liquids as soon as possible. So even though the trencher was designed to be as small as possible, uh, it doesn't fit the trench uh, that it makes itself. So you gotta pay attention if there are maybe like, you know, some slime blocks that would stick to blocks on the sides and uh, I would recommend you, well, you just mine them manually. And there is one more thing before I cut to the next clip. How do you stop the trencher? Well, you just place a redstone block here and when the trencher returns, uh, it's just going to stop. It's not going to launch for the next uh, cycle until, of course, you decide to do it yourself. There we go. So now you just gotta let it run until the end. Uh, and by the way, the end doesn't necessarily have to be the bedrock level, uh, because the quarry uh, will not be built at the bedrock level. Uh, going down to Y-55 is already gonna be enough, so I'm just gonna skip to that point. Alright, so after you are done with the main trench, uh, it's time to make the tunnel bore. So obviously the first thing you gotta do to make a tunnel bore is to, well, get the schematic of your tunnel bore. And nobody will ever share a schematic of a tunnel board that is exactly as wide as uh, you need it to be. So I'm going to show you how to tile a tunnel board to your desire. So let's say this is the tunnel board I'm gonna use, also made by Desu by the way, and I want to make this tunnel board 250 blocks wide instead of 34. So what am I gonna do is I'm going to make a new area selection, I'm gonna name it temp, and what I'm gonna do is select the last couple modules of the tunnel bore and I'm gonna make sure that I select everything right just just, just a couple last modules and this is absolutely fine so I'm going to save this as an in-memory only schematic so I'm going to hold shift and save the schematic right doesn't matter so now if I go into loaded schematics it's going to appear here so I'm going to create placement and I'm going to reposition this schematic over what I just had and maybe also disable the original schematic because it doesn't matter anymore and also the area selection it doesn't matter anymore so what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift over the schematic I just made just so it aligns up with the last module and I'm going to paste I'm going to move it back again and paste again and and I'm going to repeat this process until I am happy with the width of my tunnel board I'm just going to do it a couple more times and in case your tunnel bore is insanely wide, uh, you can also repeat the first part of the process, which is, you know, making the area selection of more modules so we can repaste more modules at a time. Uh, so, yeah, that's how, <laughs> that's how you can tile basically anything in the game. Alright, so now my tunnel bore is as wide as I need it to be. So I'm just going to make a new area selection, call it Tunnel Bore 250. And I'm just going to take a schematic of it. Yeah, I have it all selected, now I'm just going to save schematic and save. There we go. So you want the floor of your tunnel to be at Y-55 uh, because this is the lava level. If I fly into the terrain you're going to see that uh, there is a bunch of lava at exactly Y-55. You don't want to go any lower. So this is the floor level, then we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and this is the ceiling, and the ceiling can touch, well, uh, the glass can touch the ceiling. So this is approximately the alignment in the Y direction. You also gotta remember to put the initial tunnel bore like several blocks away from the initial wall because, well, if you launch it like that, it's immediately gonna blow itself up. I'm just going to move it back a bit. All right, that would seem absolutely fine. So normally you would just build it in survival, but since I'm in creative, I'm just going, going to paste it in. Okay, everything seems fine. Nothing is touching the tunnel bore. And now uh, you gotta also remember to load the other side, but uh, I have the load bot, so it's absolutely fine. Of course, instead of using a carpet bot, you can also use your alt account, or in case your tunnel bore is very short, you can also load it yourself. Uh, so now what you gotta do... Oh, I forgot to replace the target with a node block. So now all you gotta do to activate the tunnel bore is to press the node block and it's going to shoot the TNT twice, actually. Uh, that's uh, because the tunnel bore is completely gravel proof. As I said before, gravel is the number one tunnel bore killer, and this tunnel bore kind of ignores gravel by shooting the TNT twice in front of it. 
So realistically, the only thing that can break this tunnel bore are just liquids leaking in. So as I said before, this is by far the most time intensive part of the entire process of making a quarry. Uh, but uh, you can make it a bit easier on yourself. Uh, so for example, if you want to make it kind of automatic, uh, it's kind of dangerous also, but uh, it will save a lot of time, is for example, you can put a bot in here and make the bot look at this node block and make the bot use at 200 game tick interval. So I'm going to do it on myself. So player JKM use interval 200. And just for the sake of the video, I'm going to speed this up, take warp 3000, and you're going to see that I am moving forward, well, very fast because I am tech warping, but yeah, I can automatically move the tunnel bore every 200 game ticks. So player JKM stop. And there we go, we made so much progress. Realistically, you would just put a bot in there and, you know, fly around on your own, trying to look for some lava and uh, water flowing in. So yeah, uh, this is going to take a lot of time in survival, so good luck. <laughs> So after you finally run the tunnel bore all the way to the end of the area, uh, you're going to work on the three white trenches on each side of the area. And to start working on that, we need to, well, first of all, align the schematics. Uh, but to do that, first we need to get the actual schematic of the quarry that we're going to use. All right, so how do you title the quarry? Uh, so the quarry comes in three schematics, uh, start, middle and end. So you're going to start by pasting the start schematic. All right, there we go. Now you're going to move to the middle schematic and you're going to basically start pasting it over and over. Uh, but before you paste, you actually make sure it's aligned. Yeah, there we go. You paste it and then you move it over and paste it again. Of course, it has to be aligned just like that. And you go over and over until you reach the 250 blocks or whatever your choice of a quarry is. Now, before I actually go too far, I actually want to tell you a bit about the tileability of this quarry. Uh, so this quarry tiles every 12 blocks minus one. So for example, we wouldn't be able to tile this quarry to exactly 250 blocks because 250 isn't divisible by 12. But for example, we can get to 252 minus one, which is 251, and that is a valid tileability of this quarry. So that's why I wanted to make the main trench a bit wider. So in case the tileability of this quarry doesn't work to our favor, uh, we're not in trouble. <laughs> okay, so even though the tiling schematic is 24 blocks wide, uh, the quarry is actually, like I said, 12 block tileable. So I can go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, oh, sorry, 12, there we go. And as you can see, everything else is, you know, absolutely fine. So even though the schematic is 24 blocks wide, uh, you can offset it by 12 blocks and it's still gonna work. I'm gonna paste this schematic in, there we go. And now I'm going to move to the end schematic. So I'm just going to bring it back here. So I'm going to align the schematic just here, perfect. And there we go. So this is our 251 block wide quarry. So I'm not going to waste your time in this tutorial, but uh, usually you would want to, you know, try this quarry out before you actually align it in survival, because maybe you made a mistake along the way, but uh, I know for sure that I didn't, so I'm just gonna skip through. So you definitely want to divide your quarry schematic when you take it into subregions. So you definitely want to put the entire top part of the quarry into a single subregion, uh, then you want to take, you know, the entire middle part into a different subregion, and also uh, this bottom part with the slabs, uh, you also want to make it into a unique subregion. And that's exactly what I've done. So uh, the entire top part uh, with the terracotta, that's going to be very convenient for later, uh, is in the top part of the schematic. Then we have the middle part and then the bottom part. So now you can finally take a schematic of the quarry. So save schematic, name it however you want to save it. There we go. And now we're going to go back to the actual world. Okay, so after you approximately load the schematic into the hole, uh, you first of all you want to align the schematic with the Y level. Unfortunately, this particular tunnel bore leaves a couple blocks at the bottom most level, as you can see here, which will pretty much break the bottom part. So I'm, I'm just going to use the couple blocks of space that is also made above here to, you know, just move the schematic head block up 
So in case there are some random blocks at this Y level, uh, the quarry will just ignore them because it's going to run above them. Another thing you're going to notice is that uh, the Y level of the top part is completely off, and that is why I wanted to make the top part of the quarry a different subregion. Because now you can just go into your quarry schematic, you're going to go into the top part subregion, and you're going to modify the Y value to the maximum value that you chose before, which in our case was Y level 200. So I'm going to put this in, and there we go. It's already looking way better. Uh, I'm going to delete this later. Basically, after you are done with aligning the quarry schematic, you can finally align the free white trenchers. Uh, so, unfortunately, the free white trenchers align differently on the left and right side of the quarry, so I'm going to start with the left side of the quarry. So I'm just going to place a couple of those endstone bricks and disable the quarry schematic for now. And I'm going to load in the free white trencher that I linked in the description, which is this free white trencher by voiding. So, uh, first of all, I gotta rotate it, of course. Okay, so on the left side of the quarry, how do you align the free white trencher? Uh, you basically align it so the slime blocks uh, are on the same axis as the endstone wall. So, uh, basically, this is the negative positive Z alignment. And then you're gonna bring it down a bit, so the bottom part of the trencher uh, is inside of the tunnel board area. Actually, I can place it a couple blocks higher, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, so this is basically the alignment of the left freeway trencher. Just align the center uh, with the endstone wall. So to align the right freeway trencher, you're going to load the schematic of the quarry again and uh, place a couple of those glass and endstone blocks. And then you're obviously going to disable the quarry schematic again, enable the freeway trencher. And uh, so with the left trencher, it was pretty simple. You just had to align the trencher with the endstone wall. However, for the right freeway trench, uh, you have to align the schematic of the trencher with the gap in between the glass and endstone. So you gotta align it so the slime stone is right here, right in the center of those two blocks. So this is the alignment for this trencher. So once again, you're gonna move it a bit lower, okay, maybe a couple blocks higher. Yeah, so yeah, th this is already a fine alignment for the freeway trencher. So now when you have alignment for the left and right uh, freeway trenches, uh, you can build them, but hold on, you still can't really run them because uh, there are some issues that may be caused by the terrain in front of the machine. So the first issue is that uh, the trencher doesn't really mine everything from uh, Y-55 to build limit. It only mines it up to around, what is this, around 126. Uh, and, well, do I really have to tell you that this is going to be an issue? <laughs> Uh, yeah, unfortunately, you're going to have to manually uh, get rid of some of the blocks in in the way of the free white trencher. And honestly, probably the best way to get rid of those blocks above the maximum Y level of the trencher uh, is to just run a single TNT duper. Just build a TNT duper like 80 blocks above the maximum Y level of the trencher and just run it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until you finally get rid of all of those extra blocks that will be in the way of the trencher. So after you remove all the blocks above the maximum Y level of the free white trencher, you still can't really run it because there is another issue you may encounter while running the freeway trencher. So namely, the problem is water and lava mixing together and forming cobblestone. Uh, so water is very common, uh, lava is a bit rarer, especially if you are above the uh, magical level of minus 55. Uh, but yeah, it can happen that uh, water flowing from uh, sides of the trench uh, mixed with lava flowing from the sides of the trench and they mix together form cobblestone and the trencher pretty much gets stuck. So you can deal with this issue in two ways. Uh, you can either repair the trencher every single time it breaks along the way, or you can just make like an area selection of the free white trench and basically fly in spectator and see if there are going to be any lava sources that are going to flow into the trench. And if there is maybe some water above and if there is, that means that you gotta remove this lava source because the water and lava is going to make and break the trencher. So another important thing is that before launching the quarry, um, you definitely want to cover all the lava and water sources that are flowing into the area. Uh, before running the quarry, the side trenches have to be perfectly dry. Uh, you can't have any liquids flowing into the three white trenches. 
Breaking news! Desu has just finished designing a new freeway trencher that automatically covers up some of the side liquids while it's running. The alignment is the same as Voiding's, however, it hasn't been tested extensively in survival yet, so make sure to test it in creative first before building it in survival. So the next step is going to be removing all the unmovable blocks, so chests, spawners, obsidian, crying obsidian and so on, right? And like I said before, this isn't really viable to do in full vanilla. You can't really just look around in spectator honor in freecam if there are any unmovable blocks, because trust me, you're gonna miss them, and you're gonna miss a lot. So that's why me and Babu wrote a program in Python uh, that is looking for those unmovable blocks. So what you're gonna do is, first of all, you're going to take a lightmatic of the area that you wanna analyze. So just for the sake of the tutorial, I'm only gonna analyze this small area here because the entire area is just way too big for the program to analyze in a reasonable amount of time. So I'm just going to take a schematic of this area. So I'm just going to call that schematic quarry. There we go. Save, save. And there we go, it's saved. So now I'm going to switch to my desktop and show you how to run the program. Alright, so you're going to run the blockfinder.exe program and the first thing that it's going to do is going to ask you for a lightmatic file of the area that you want to analyze. So I'm just going to go to my quarry schematic, there we go. Okay, so after you select the lightmatic file, the program is going to ask you for uh, the most negative x, y, and z coordinates. That is because, well, the program has to know where in the world the schematics is located, right? So we're just gonna give it the most negative x coordinate, which is this one here, there we go. Then the smallest or most negative y coordinate, which is minus 47. And then the most negative z coordinates, which is minus 84,085. There we go. So this is the default list of blocks that the program is going to analyze for. Uh, in case you want to look for different blocks, you can type yes and play with the program, but we're going to go with no. We want the default list of blocks. Would you like to cluster obsidian? So obsidian usually forms in like huge clusters of like 50 or even more obsidian, and you definitely don't want to have like 50 waypoints pointing to a single position. So we're gonna go with clustering. Uh, now it's gonna ask you if you want Xeros or voxel map. Uh, I'm using voxel map, so I'm gonna go with V. And now we just gotta wait. Holy shit, Python is terrible. Wow, it's still loading in. Okay, the program is finally analyzing the area. So after the program is done, it's going to ask you where you would like to save your waypoints. So I'm going to just save them to my desktop, and I'm going to name this file waypoints. And the file that the program spit out it contains all the waypoints uh, for voxel map that I can use. Uh, so now you can just go to your .minecraft directory and find the voxel map waypoint file, and you can just copy and paste those waypoints uh, so you can actually, well, so you can actually see the waypoints uh, in game. Okay, so I finally located my waypoints file. So I'm just going to Control C and Control V. I'm just gonna save and relaunch the game, and if I rejoin the world, I should be able to see all the waypoints in place. Alright, moment of truth. Let's see if we actually get the waypoints. And yeah, we do. <laughs> nice. Uh, it's always nice to see when it works. So basically, wherever there was an unmovable block uh, that was in the list, of course, uh, we got a waypoint. So now you can just, you know, fly around, look for the waypoints, and mine the spawners, chests, and whatever else. Alright, so finally, after running the tunnel board, running the freeway trenchers, removing the unmovable blocks, you can finally go ahead and build your quarry. By the way, quick note, uh, you don't have to build this uh, giant stone wall, it's kind of just an indicator as to where the terrain is going to begin. Unfortunately, you still can't really run it, uh, because you are missing the storage. Uh, so unfortunately, I can't really help with this part of the project. Different areas from different biomes can have a lot of different blocks, so it's it's kind of impossible to make a universal storage for all the quarries that anyone would ever make. Uh, so I can't really help with this part of the project. Uh, however, I can recommend a couple things. So probably the simplest way to deal with items from the quarry is to build this kind of uh, water stream. 
Uh, and after some time, you can redirect the item stream to go into a bubble column, for example. And then you could take the items all the way up here and do some kind of sorting, however you want to do it. You can use stack separation, you can use just a bunch of uh, double speed shulker loaders, you can use basically whatever you want to. I'm not really a storage tech expert, and I'm not qualified to give you tips on how to like design the storage for your particular quarry. Generally, I would like to redirect you to the storage tech discord. Uh, on that discord, you can find a lot of schematics for shulker loaders, item filters, stack separation filters, and so much more that I literally cannot comprehend. And maybe if we manage to annoy enough people, <laughs> they will finally make uh, some kind of universal quarry sorter that will fit everyone. Uh, highly unlikely, but yeah, uh, unfortunately we, you have to deal with the storage yourself. Alright, so after you're finally done with all of the prior steps, and you actually made double, triple and quadruple check that everything is absolutely fine, I would recommend you also take a backup, but after you're done with all of the preparation, you can finally launch the quarry. So I've already shown it running, but uh, I haven't shown you how to stop the quarry. Well, it's pretty simple. You just flick the node block again, and uh, as soon as the quarry arrives back at the bottom, uh, it's just going to stop. It's not going to run for the next cycle. Oh no, my quarry stopped because something happened here uh, that wasn't supposed to happen. So the slabs didn't get pushed forward and the quarry stopped. That's one of the safety mechanisms. Uh, so how do you fix the quarry in case this happens? Uh, well, obviously you have to remove the blocks that caused the, the problem. Uh, then you're gonna make those slabs move forward, there we go. I am still tick warping. And then, uh, yeah, you basically have to pull uh, the slabs backwards again. So in a second the signal is going to arrive here. And even though the signal reached the end here, uh, the quarry still hasn't done anything, because uh, you still manually have to reset this exact piston. It's on the right side of the quarry, and it's uh, the right most sticky piston is going to be very easy to find. So I'm just going to activate it. So yeah, everything pushes forward, and the quarry is launching again. Uh, so you can also prevent the quarry from launching after fixing the failure by first stopping the quarry and then activating the sticky piston. Uh, I would recommend actually doing that instead of what I just did. Oh no, there is obsidian in front of my quarry and the grabber is about to get stuck. So what will happen now? So the second failure mode is when the quarry gets stuck on some unmovable blocks in front of the quarry, uh, like for example here with uh, the obsidian that I placed manually. So what happens now? So once again there is another safety mechanism up here, uh, this is an end gate. So basically every single one of the grabbers has to arrive literally in the same game tick up here uh, for the quarry to launch the TNT. So in case even a single grabber is missing, uh, the quarry is not going to launch the TNT until uh, we fix the issue and activate the quarry ourselves. So when it comes to this failure mode, you're mostly gonna encounter it uh, in this kind of state where most of the water already dropped down except for this particular module. Uh, so what you're going to do is obviously you're going to remove the part that is broken. Uh, you're also going to remove the blocks that were supposed to be pulled back because, well, we gotta make space for the water carton to be dropped through. So then you're gonna come up here, uh, move the terracotta and glass, of course, uh, and now you're gonna have to push uh, this part forward. Um, before you do that, you actually make sure that everything has been cleared out. So I'm going to place uh, two pistons right here. I'm first going to activate this one with the observer and then this one. There we go. So now the water... fuck. <laughs> you also gotta move this one, of course. I forgot. Uh, so now the water carton gets dropped down. Uh, while it's dripping down, you can also rebuild the module. So usually I would recommend you to take a schematic of a couple modules that are absolutely fine and uh, align it with here. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of clear what broke, so I need definitely those four slime blocks. Uh, I need two sticky pistons here. And I'm missing two observers here. Uh, what about here? Uh, yeah, I'm missing glass, so every observer has a glass here. So now this module should be fixed. Alright, so after you're absolutely 100% sure that the quarry is fixed, uh, you're going to come to the end of the piston line and you're going to activate this piston. So this will cause this piece of water to drop down, uh, which is later going to activate the dupers. Uh, and the quarry is going to, you know, finish the cycle that it started. So yeah, that's basically how you fix the quarry if it breaks. 
All right, so that's basically it for the video. Uh, once again, I want to thank Desu and Javi for designing this quarry. This is ah, this is such a beautiful machine. And yeah, I really hope to see people actually start making quarries after this video. So I really hope you enjoyed. Uh, I'm sorry for wasting like almost an hour of your time. Uh, and yeah, see ya.